everyone, and welcome to the Hands-On Deep Learning and IoT Workshop. Um, we're really excited to join Women in Data Science today um, for a day of wonderful workshops, so thank you very much for having us. Before we get started with the material, uh, we'd like to go ahead and introduce ourselves. So my name is Sarah Mohammed, uh, and I'm a software engineer at MathWorks working on deep learning interoperation. Today in the session, I'll be covering uh, one of our background topics, AI. And I'll hand it over to Shruti to introduce herself. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. I am Shruti Karulkar. I am Quality Engineering Manager at MathWorks, and I work with various hardware teams. Today, I would be talking about Internet of Things. Over to you, Lou. Hello, and thank you very much. My name is Lou Vera Walker Hannon. Feel free to call me Lou. I'm a senior application engineer with MathWorks, and I work with many customers who are trying to implement AI as a part of their various workflows. Today, I will highlight information related to some of the exercises from the workshop and provide the final information and conclusion as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Luver and Shruti. And we'd love to hear from you in the audience as well. Please introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, let us know who you are and where you're joining us from. And next, we're going to cover some logistics for the session. So today, you're going to run three hands-on exercises. And in order to do the exercise, um, you'll need a few things. Um, of course, you'll need a computer with access to the internet. You'll need a webcam and a MathWorks account um, to get access to MATLAB Online and MATLAB Drive. So MATLAB Online is a browser-based environment, and you'll need to be using Google Chrome in order to run the exercises today. So we'll help you get set up in MATLAB Online and with a MathWorks account with some pre-work that we would like you to complete. And the link to the pre-work is going to be posted by our teaching assistants in the chat. To give you a quick overview of that pre-work, it will have some information about how to get access to MATLAB Online, um, get access to a license to use the products that you'll use today, and uh, guide you through setting up a MathWorks account as well, along with instructions to get the exercises. So don't worry if you haven't uh, started the pre-work yet or if you're just joining us. We will have time later on in the session uh, to do the pre-work before you first start the exercises, and we'll check in with you to make sure that you can run the code. If at any point you have any questions, please do feel free to post those in the chat. Um, like we said earlier, today we're joined by a wonderful team of teaching assistants who are going to be uh, helping you to troubleshoot and answer any questions that you might have. So today you're going to see how easy it is to get started with deep learning and IoT. The workshop today is 45 minutes long. So you won't be building a deep neural network or a complete IoT system from scratch, um, but you'll accomplish at least these three objectives. So first, you'll see how easy it is to access world-class deep learning research models that do object detection on real objects around your house. Then you'll learn how to send that object recognition data to what's called a data aggregator using the Internet of Things. And finally, you'll learn how to access all of the data that you aggregate and analyze it in the cloud. Our plan today is to spend the first 10 minutes or so introducing the core concepts of deep learning and the Internet of Things. And then for the next 10 minutes or less, um, we'll set up for the hands-on exercises and make sure that everybody is all caught up on the pre-work. Finally, for the remaining bulk of the time together, we'll spend doing those hands-on exercises. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive into some of the background material, first by introducing AI. By a quick show of hands, how many of us feel like we interact with AI on a regular daily basis? You can let us know in the chat. Um, you can use one of those emojis in Zoom. Um, let us know what you think. I think it's, it's pretty difficult to avoid today. It, it really is being used everywhere across so many of our daily tools and also throughout industry as well. So, for example, if you use Spotify, uh, Amazon, if you're driving a car, so many of our services are being curated to specific people um, and becoming more smart. And there are some other examples across industry, too. So, for example, in the upper left corner here, we have an example of using AI to identify cancerous cells. In the upper right, we can see an example of a smart robotic arm that can be used on manufacturing floors. The lower left has an example of automatic language translation from an image on a mobile device. 
And then maybe most famously on the lower uh, right hand corner here is a depiction of a smart driving system uh, that uses vehicle perception. And the cornerstone of so many of these advances that make all of this possible in AI over the last few years has been deep learning. So we'll take a look at an example of that in action uh, and as a preview for our exercises. Here we're looking at a 35 second video that highlights deep learning in action. So we have this webcam that's uh, roving around the room and whenever the webcam has an object in front of it, it an object is classified. And then on the right hand side of the screen here, there's a list of five potential categories. And the one at the top is the one that's most likely the correct category according to our deep learning model. The percentages that you see in the parentheses reflect the confidence score for each one of those classes. And you can think of that as being the model's estimate of how likely the object is to fall into that category. So in this demo, we're using a pre-trained deep neural network for object detection and classification. And you can think of each frame in that video as, as having been its own image. In general, deep learning can be used for lots of different types of data and many different types of tasks, but today we're going to focus on the type of data and task that made deep learning famous, which is images and object recognition. So you might be wondering why deep learning has been having such a huge impact across all of these different industries. And one of the powers of deep learning is that it automates this step of the more general machine learning workflow called feature extraction. So often, and especially for images, automated feature extraction can accomplish something better than what a human might be able to accomplish manually. So what is feature extraction? At a high level, you can think about it as uh, finding the meaningful properties or pieces of your raw data that the model needs to learn how to accomplish a task. So deep learning can do often a better job of choosing features automatically, which saves us uh, time and effort from having to do that task manually. And developing a deep learning model involves a few steps if we're doing it from scratch. So first you need to gather some data, um, you'd need to define the architecture of your model, and of course you'd need to train it and tune its hyperparameters to get an acceptable accuracy. But there are pre-trained deep neural networks that are already uh, able to perform certain tasks for you. And AlexNet is one such pre-trained model, and it's perhaps one of the most well-known research models for object recognition. It was trained on millions of images scraped from the internet and is capable of classifying a thousand different categories. So if you use it with an object that it was trained to classify, then you should see a high accuracy. But if you show it an object that perhaps it's less familiar with, um, then it might not be able to classify it at all, or at least the scores for the predicted classes will be lower. But in addition to AlexNet, this isn't the only one. There are many other pre-trained models developed by researchers that are publicly available and that we can use to accomplish tasks using deep learning. So here on the slide is just a sampling of some of the popular models that are used for object classification. So ResNet, um, BGG16 or BGG19, and GooglyNet are some of those to name a few. And all of the models um, that I just mentioned have been pre-trained to identify a thousand different types of objects. But is that enough? As you might guess, no, not all objects are gonna be correctly classified all of the time. And that might be because uh, an object doesn't fall into one of those 1000 classes that the model was trained to identify, but there can be other reasons too. And if we look at this plate of fries as an example, we can see that GooglyNet thinks that this image is chocolate sauce. And the low score there reflects some of its uncertainty about what uh, object is contained in the image. So what factors do you all think might be affecting the model's ability to classify this image? Feel free to shout those out in the chat. Um, but here are just a few factors like the lighting in the image, like brightness and contrast, um, the position of the object, like how it's oriented in space and whether it's completely in the frame, and whether there are multiple objects in the image or some of those factors. And of course, like we mentioned before, you might ask whether the network was even trained to identify images like this one. So all of these will have an impact on the output of the model. And in the exercises ahead, you'll have a chance to observe some of that when you classify your own household objects using your webcam. 
All right, but before we get to the exercises, uh, my friend and colleague Shruti is going to introduce the Internet of Things or IoT, which we'll use later to aggregate and analyze predictions that we collect from a deep learning model. So let me hand the mic over to Shruti. Thank you, Sarah. Let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. Ah. Sarah, can you please stop sharing? Okay, thank you. Okay. Can everyone see my screen okay? Perfect. Now let's move on to the next topic for today, which is Internet of Things. Let's hear what's the all the buzz about IoT or Internet of Things. As you would have known, this is a very interactive session. So I want to hear from you. How many of you already use smart fitness trackers like Fitbit or Apple Watch? Let us know via the chat window. Do any of you have any home automation devices like Nest thermostat? Okay, I see a few of us typing in the chat here. So the good news is if you have been using um, these smart fitness trackers or home automation devices, you are already in the IoT ecosystem. All these different smart devices like Fitbit or even our smartphones, these devices are generating data. This data is sent to the cloud. In the cloud, we have various IoT platforms which help us aggregate the data, analyze the data. Now, there are several IoT platforms out there, but today we would be talking about and actually using one such IoT platform, which is ThingSpeak. ThingSpeak is an open IoT platform with MATLAB analytics. Let me give you a small example of IoT in my home. I have a Nest thermostat set up in my living room. And anytime the temperature goes over 80 degrees, I get, get an email about it. Sounds familiar? So this is a simple example of IoT. Now let's see what is a typical IoT workflow. We begin by collecting data. Now this data can be temperature in the example of a Nest thermostat, or in case of our fitness devices, it can be the number of steps that we took. We are collecting or aggregating data. The next step in the IoT workflow is to analyze the data. And this might mean just having different plots, making trends, or even applying machine learning algorithms. That's what we just learned uh, in the previous section and what we are going to do today. We are going to apply AlexNet, which is a machine learning algorithm to the data. And last step of IoT workflow is to act based on the analyzed data. Now this can mean sending an email or making Twitter updates. These are simple ways of sending notification or acting based on the data that was analyzed. In the example that you heard about my home automation system, the act of sending an email is the act portion of the IoT workflow. Okay, so today, you are going to implement, collect, and analyze portions of the IoT workflow. We don't have ACT piece to implement, but we do have take home exercises for you, which will help you implement this. Now, let's talk a little bit about logistics. You learned concepts of machine learning and IoT. Now, let's see how we can implement these. Let's quickly go over what we will need to do the exercises today. You will need a laptop or a desktop, be connected to Wi-Fi. Please use the Google Chrome browser for executing the exercises today. You will need a webcam, 
and you will need a MathWorks account. We have all these steps listed in our pre-work. We have a wonderful team of TAs here who will be posting a link to our pre-work in the chat. If you haven't done the pre-work yet, that is okay. You will have time to do this pre-work as and when we start doing the exercise. If you have any questions or if you run into any issues while doing the pre-work, let us know. Our TAs will do their best to answer any questions or issues that you might be running into. Just keep on asking questions via the chat window. Okay, now it's time to try out our first exercise. And let me tell you, what is the goal of our first exercise? In this exercise, you are going to apply AlexNet and do, do some object classification. Let's go ahead and review uh, the code for our first exercise. The first step is to create an object for our webcam. We are going to use your webcam and we are going to use a MATLAB function webcam to make connection to your uh, webcam. Next, we are going to load the neural net, AlexNet, which we are going to use for object classification. In the next section, we are going to take a snapshot of the object that you are going to show your webcam. We will then do the classification using AlexNet. We will then compute a confidence score to see how well or how confident our AlexNet is in doing the object classification, and we will display that score. Lastly, we will display an image that was taken by your webcam and display the confidence score for the same. Okay, I have a few reminders for you. This is what Sarah mentioned. There are several factors which impact object classification results. Uh, factors like lighting in your room, position of the object, how oh, did you orient the object in front of the webcam? The angle matters. Was it just the one object that you showed the webcam or did you have several objects? Let me give you an example. If I showed just say for example, Apple, uh, to my uh, webcam, I could get a different confidence score versus I show a fruit basket. I think the uh, output is going to be different in uh, both these cases. Also, what was uh, the neural network trained on? Did the object that you show your webcam, was uh, that used to train the uh, AlexNet? That is going to impact the results as well. My friend Lou here took her own uh, snapshot and these were the results that we got. And we know for sure uh, it wasn't a shower cap or an umbrella or a wig. So you can see for yourself how these factors that we just discussed impact the results that we get. Okay, now let's see how we are going to execute our first hands-on exercise. Open MATLAB online in your Google Chrome browser. Once you do that, hold an object that you want to classify in front of the webcam. Next, identify what is the code for your exercise one. You will see a file named exercise one. Open that in your editor and place your cursor on line number one. On the tool strip above, you will see a run button. Click that button that will execute the code. For the very first time that you run this code, you will see a pop-up to allow using the webcam in your Chrome browser. Click allow over here. After that, you will get the result. You will see a snapshot that was taken along with the confidence score. We are going to take four minutes to do this exercise. For those of you who haven't done the pre-work yet, now is the time to do so. It is 12.05 Eastern time. Let's regroup at 12.09. Let's get started.
we have two more minutes to do this exercise. How is it going? Let us know via the chat window if you are running into any issues. Okay, we have one more minute. Okay, it's 12.09, let's regroup. Let us know via the chat window, how many of you were able to run the, this exercise? Anyone? Okay, I see a few of us answering. For those of you who weren't able to run this exercise, it is okay. You will have opportunity to run this code again in the next exercise. Okay, I have few follow-up questions for you. Do you think that the objects that you showed your uh, webcam, did they get classified? Were you happy with the classification results that you got? What are the few ideas that you can think that will help improve the accuracy of the classification? Let us know via the chat uh, window and we will keep the conversation going over there. For now, I will hand it over to Lou for the next exercise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shruti. And I will share my screen. And I will also put my presentation in presentation mode. Give me a second. And I just wanted to check, can you see my slide. So we have here. Perfect. Thank you so much for the verification. So we had some really interesting results for that last exercise, and maybe that trend will continue for the next two exercises. So in terms of the next exercise, we actually get to kind of explore that topic. So all of us, wherever we're located, or quite a few of us may be curious to find out, hmm, what are other people getting in terms of their objects being recognized? So we're going to explore sending that object recognition data, so those labels to the objects, to an Internet of Things data aggregator. And the Internet of Things platform that we're going to be using is called Things Speak. So we're going to take those labels that were highlighted based on what was recognized and send them to a channel via Things Speak. Now, what is this going to look like in terms of code? Let's explore that now. So in terms of code for the second exercise, just as you've seen before, we're going to get an overview of this code, highlight each section of the code, and then take a few minutes to execute that code. So just as we've seen before, and by the way, a lot of this code may look familiar, the final part of the code will be different, will be updated. So we're going to connect to our web camera that we're using, use AlexNet. We're using AlexNet because it's one of the more popular pre-trained networks for object recognition. We could have used others. And then we have these additional steps. So as a part of that overall data science workflow, we may have to to implement some sort of pre-processing, which we're doing here. So after we take the snapshot, we're resizing the image, and then we're going to classify the image. We return both the labels and a confidence score. Then for our output, we have a figure window, and the title of that figure window should include 
both the category as well as the confidence score. So how confident the neural network was with recognizing the object based on what it was trained on. Here's the new piece of the code or newer piece of the code. We're going to communicate with things speak. And specifically, we're going to write that label data. The objects that were recognized has labels to a channel using things speak. We have some settings in place to help us write that information to the channel. Now, you're not just writing your data. Any of us who are doing these exercises right now are going to also have their data written to this channel. The reason why I point this out is because we have that pause for a certain amount of time in place. So all of the data can be sent to that channel at this point in time. Now, in terms of the exercise itself, just to review the different sections of code, we're going to connect to the camera, we're going to call AlexNet, and we're going to take that snapshot from the camera, resize, classify, and view our results in a figure window and pay attention to that title at the top of the figure window. That title is going to have the object that's classified, so that category, and a confidence score. Finally, when we run this last section of code, we're going to write data to a channel via the ThingSpeak platform. Now, just as a side note, you may notice this link at the bottom of the slide where it's just highlighting information about ThingSpeak and this particular channel where we're writing this data. Now, in terms of being able to do this exercise, let's take three minutes to do this exercise. Once again, please return to the MATLAB online environment, open this file named exercise two in the MATLAB editor. And once this code is open, please press the green run button. We have teaching assistants who are in the chat who are able to help you out. Thank you. And let's take three minutes for the exercise. Right now, I see it's 12, 14 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And I'll check in again at 12, 17 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Thank you. As you're doing the exercise as well, you know, feel free to share any of your results in the chat. I think that's really interesting. We saw some really interesting results before. Just taking a quick look at the, the chat for a second. Let's see. I do want to point out one item. I I know some of us are still doing the exercise. There's a great point about someone saying, oh, you know, it would be nice if, you know, we could select which part of a scenery you focus on while taking a photograph. It's interesting that you bring that up. We have something similar in another workshop of ours. So, not in this workshop. Okay. And my colleague Jen is highlighting we have a few seconds left. Okay. And it looks like it's 1217 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I'm just looking at the chat very briefly. So one person is sharing that their ceiling rim was identified as a seat belt and that their phone was identified as an iPod. That's interesting. So hopefully 
those of us who are trying to do the exercise are still able to run the code and getting some interesting results. For now, let's move forward. But if you're still doing the exercise, you know, please continue for the next few minutes. However, we have a third exercise coming up. So as far as that third exercise goes, we have this final component. So we took the Things Speak platform and wrote this label information to this particular location. But I think it would be nice. I think it would be interesting if we were able to find out for all of us during this time frame together who are doing these exercises, I wonder, you know, are we getting the same results? How many of us may be getting the same results? So the reason why we think about these topics is because we can actually get access to the data from the IoT aggregator and visualize this content to not only notice what we had recognized on our own machines, but what others may have had recognized as they were doing this exercise. This brings us to the third and final exercise. So we're going to review the code first, specifically look at the code section by section and take some time to run the code and hopefully see some results. So this code looks quite different versus the other two files. So one of the biggest reasons is because the task is quite different. So in this particular case, we're communicating with Things Speak yet again. This time we're going to read information from Things Speak. Specifically, we're reading data from a particular channel, the channel that we wrote the data to a few minutes ago. And specifically, we have this information. I always find this interesting. There's a property called num minutes, which stands for number of minutes, and it says 120. So it means over the last 120 minutes, the last two hours, so the time frame in which we're doing this particular workshop, let's see about getting access to all the labels that were sent to this channel. Then in the second part of the code, we're going to visualize the data that we took from the Things Speak channel. For this visualization, we're going to have a histogram. And with that histogram on the X axis, we're going to have the objects detected. So the labels of those various objects should be on the X axis. Then on the Y axis, we have the number of items detected. So how many times these particular objects were detected. And then we have a title that generally points out these were the objects detected by the deep learning network, in this case, AlexNet. Now, as far as the code goes, once again, you have this first section for saying, let's take the data from this particular thing speak channel. And the second section of code where we say, let's take that data that we've acquired from the things speak channel and create a histogram. Once again, a big reminder is this histogram should give us an overview of anyone that was doing this exercise or those exercises over the past few minutes, what else did they see in terms of what was recognized on their systems? Now, in terms of the exercise and doing the exercise, let's run this code. So in this particular case, let's return to MATLAB online. Let's open up the file named exercise three. Once that file is open in the MATLAB editor, you'll see some buttons at the top of the screen. And if you place your cursor on line number one in the file, at the very topmost line in the file, you should be able to press the green run button. Once again, we have teaching assistants in the chat who are able to help out. They're also able to answer questions in the Q&A. Right now, time-wise, it's 12.21 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. This exercise can sometimes take a few minutes. So let's take four minutes to do this exercise. So once again, let's take four minutes to do this exercise. And I'll check in again at 12.25 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Thank you. And once again, feel free to share results in the chat if you feel comfortable doing so. Thank you. I'm seeing people highlight success already. Okay. A few people are pointing out how exercise three had worked for them. This is helpful to know. Those of us who are in the MATLAB online environment, you know, pay attention to where your cursor is highlighted. 
is your cursor in the editor window. Great results, nice to know. A few people are sharing results and I'll point out what those results are in a few seconds. So keep sharing those results. We like to see results. Okay, and keep sharing information about your results. This is very interesting for us to know. Okay, as my colleague Jen highlighted, we have a few seconds left for this exercise. Okay, I see where it is now 1225 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and it looks as if we have some interesting results. So thank you for sharing those results. I'm going to highlight a few of those results in a few seconds. Those of you who are still working on the exercise, please take these next few minutes to try to work on this exercise. The teaching assistants are here and helping out in the chat and also through that Q&A panel. Thank you. So here are some of the results I'm going to highlight. I'm just reading through the chat right now. So it looks as if quite a few of us are pointing out how velvet seems to be the highest. So there's something happening texture-wise with some of what's being captured in the web camera. And then a few people highlighted the following. It detected sunglasses when the webcam detected the person's face with reading glasses on. I could see that, there's some overlap. And another, Item I'll point out, harmonica is the highest. So it's very interesting to find out what the network is able to identify. And thank you for sharing those results. Keep working on the exercise and we'll have some resources for you coming up in the next few minutes. For now, let's continue. Now, if you notice very quickly, you'll see that we have a visualization that's here. Now this visualization may look a little different versus a number of your own visualizations. Why? Because this was a snapshot taken during a previous time that this workshop was taught. And specifically when we taught the workshop before, we had a number of requests of the audience members. And one request was to try to get access to pieces of fruit. Why do I point this out? If you look at this histogram and look along the x-axis, notice where it says objects detected is pointing out Granny Smith, short for Granny Smith apple, lemon, banana, orange, as some of the items that were detected most frequently. So notice on the y-axis, it says number of times detected. Your visualizations may look different. And I would expect that based on the objects that you had at the time that you placed them in front of the web camera. 
So this is an example of a histogram when this third and final file was executed at another time, but you have very different results. And many of you pointed that out during the chat. So nice work, nice job. And I say, continue exploring after this workshop. Now, speaking of this workshop, congratulations. So you did the three exercises where you had the following task. You classified objects using a pre-trained model. Once again, in this case, AlexNet. You sent that data to an IoT aggregator and you visualize the data that you took from that channel from the IoT aggregator. So nice work in terms of those results. Now, there are a few topics we wanted to highlight very quickly as we end this workshop. If you recall these images from a few minutes ago, you'll remember a theme. The theme is as follows. Was AI correct every time? I will tell you that is a series of images of the top of my hair some time ago, and I can tell you these replies, these answers are not correct. For example, that's not a shower cap, not an umbrella, and definitely not a wig. So one of the items is when we think about using AI, we should definitely consider several factors when we think about using AI. And in terms of what those factors are, this is where we would like to give you some time to think and reflect in terms of information that we have related to these factors when you're using AI. And keep in mind, we're thinking of AI as a part of the data science ecosystem. So there's another image of myself. This time, the hairstyle is slightly different. And you'll notice the label says mortarboard. So it's interesting because for a lot of people at this time of year, it's graduation season. And maybe I could see that, oh, I could maybe understand how the network may think, oh, that's a mortar board, but clearly it is not. So one of the major themes that I like to point out is the fact that when we start to use AI, one of the topics we should consider is not just the accuracy of these results, but does this make sense to use AI for certain applications? So one of the big themes I hope you take away from this workshop, we have this word cloud here. And one of the biggest themes I like to highlight is the following. AI is only as smart as what it was exposed to and what it learns from, so that data that we have access to. In order to use AI, it needs to be trained with data. We use the pre-trained network in our particular case. There could be issues with the data, the AI model itself, or there could be other factors. Now, in this particular case, we have this, you know, small issue, the small misidentification. However, there are many other scenarios where this incorrect identification can have even more severe consequences. In terms of the word cloud that you see, many of us may have heard, seen, or possibly experienced some of these issues. Some of these words highlight issues that are technical in nature. For example, considering how do we automate and make AI more efficient? However, other words highlight different types of issues. For example, returning to the example image we have, based on the data that the, that the network was trained on and possibly other factors, such as the algorithm provided this particular result, we should explore what metrics we're using to determine the accuracy of obtained results from AI. In what context are we using AI? Is there bias regarding the obtained results? And is there identification of this bias? And what aspects of justice should we take into account when using AI? These problems are identified and documented in many places, but here is a question that we should consider in our data science community. That question is, what can we do as a community to address many of these factors? We're not expecting to have a lot of replies per se today, but let's take these factors into consideration as a part of AI as a part of AI in our data science ecosystem. Now, speaking of being able to think about these considerations, we have many examples that you can explore. So after this workshop, we have many examples of using AI on the MathWorks website. So for example, you have this equation, U plus sensors plus AI plus IoT equals innovation. So one of the biggest items is the following. 
the biggest item is there are all these interesting examples. But if you look in the lower right hand corner, you'll see vegetation exploration. There are a lot of resources on ramps. And also you have a thank you from the individuals who are part of this workshop. Thank you to you, the audience members. Thank you to the presenters. And this is our contact information for any follow-up questions. Thank you for your time and take care. Mm -hmm.